right, so I think we're gonna uh, I think we're gonna get started today. Um, first of all, welcome back and um, welcome to the new semester. And before I introduce our speaker today, I'd like to give you all kind of an overview of our lineup for the rest of the semester. Um, Okay, so we have many talks that address how data and technology mediate urban growth and planning, often reproducing and amplifying the physical and social realities and inequalities existent in the city. So next Tuesday, um, Jennifer Light will talk about her research on the gamification of city building in virtual worlds and augmented realities. The week after, on February 4th, Michael Batty will speak about his research on the digital representations of physical urban infrastructures and the increasing integration of the digital and the physical. Uh, more on digital mediations on March 3rd, Desiree Fields will talk about her research on digital real estate platforms. And on March 31st, Dani Arribas Bell will talk about how to use machine learning and building footprint data to understand gradients of urban boundaries. On April 21st, Catherine Dignazio and Lauren Klein will talk about their new book, Data Feminism, and how this notion can be better used to address questions of justice through data science and data visualization. Okay. So it really wasn't planned this way, but we actually have three talks about the topic of the smart city with Ben's today being the first one. Um, other ones include um, on April 14th, Rachel Franklin will talk about uh, algorithmic bias, surveillance, and socioeconomic, uh, the socioeconomic inclusion aspects of data collection in the city. On April 28th, Xiaowei Wang will talk about how smart city technologies are permeating and transforming peripheral and rural spaces in China and the US. And on the subject of urban development on the periphery, Michael Waldrop will talk about the suburbs of Mexico City and London and the kinds of social priorities revealed through suburban development. Um, that's on March 24th. And then going back to an urban context on February 11th, uh, Ingrid Gould Ellen will talk about residential neighborhood stability in the context of gentrification, historic preservation, and rent control. On March 10th, Jacqueline Huang will talk about gentrification and how it influences residential mobility and displacement for disadvantaged residents in Philadelphia. And then uh, finally, during career week in February, we have two panels on urban planning, past and future. On February 18th, there's a panel on the 1989 New York City Planning Commission, which broadened the commission's land use powers. And on February 25th, uh, we'll have a, pa a panel of people in the urban tech Startup world to discuss the role of the private se of the role of private sector innovation in shaping cities. Um, and if you didn't catch all of that, um, you can find uh, all of these uh, events available on DSAP's website. Um, and with that, um, I want to welcome Ben Green, who's going to talk about his book, The Smart Enough City. Uh, ben is a PhD candidate in applied math at Harvard. Uh, an affiliate at the Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society at Harvard, and a research fellow at the AI Now Institute at NYU. Um, he studies the social and policy impacts of data science with a focus on algorithmic fairness, municipal governments, and the criminal justice system. His book, uh, The Smart Enough City, Putting Technology in Its Place to Reclaim Our Urban Future, was published in 2019 by MIT Press. So with that, let's welcome Ben Green. Uh, this is this is great. Thank you, uh, Wenfei, for the introduction, and I'm really honored to be able to kick off what sounds like an incredible series this semester that touches on a lot of the similar themes that I explore in my book and my work, and hopefully I'll be able to make it back up for some of those later in the semester. Um, so yeah, so I want to talk about my book that came out uh, a couple months ago about smart cities. And we can keep this informal. If anytime you want to interrupt me or have questions, feel free to jump in and we can talk about whatever's on your mind. Uh, but really, the effort of this book is to bring together a couple different areas that I've been working on over the last uh, five or six years at this point. Uh, one is my academic work as a PhD student studying the implementation and the development and evaluation of algorithmic systems developed for city governments. Uh, I also spent a year as a data scientist in the city of Boston, uh, developing a variety of systems and efforts and policies, and I'll talk about some of that work, uh, and analyzing all of that through the lens of scholarship around the social impacts of technology, particularly through the lens of a field called science, technology, and society, or STS, which looks at the ways in which society and technology uh, interact and shape one another, and what the social impacts of that are. So 
I'll roughly talk about three different ideas. First is the notion of technology as a solution to social problems, uh, where I'll introduce the idea of smart cities. I'll talk about the limits of technology for social change, the dangers of viewing technology as a tool for solving uh, social issues. And then I'll talk about how do we actually use technology well? How do we bring together a variety of engineering, social, legal, policy perspectives to understand both the risks and the opportunities presented by technology and actually navigate that uh, sort of minefield responsibly and effectively. Uh, so we'll start with smart cities. And I like to start by just providing a definition. It's sort of this broad, loose term. Uh, but this is a definition that I like in the sense of giving a framework for what we typically mean when we talk about smart cities. Uh, by definition, smart cities are those that integrate information communications technology across three or more functional areas. More simply put, a smart city is one that combines traditional infrastructure, roads, buildings, and so on with technology to enrich the lives of its citizens. And so the smart city really mirrors this way in which the word smart is used across the board today. Of course, the most familiar would be your smartphone, but we have smart homes, smart toasters, smart toothbrushes. This idea of integrating digital technology, internet connectivity, data collection and analysis, artificial intelligence into traditionally analog objects. So what does this look like in practice? There can be a variety of different technologies from sensors on city street poles or uh, different parts of city infrastructure that collect data, understand the local conditions, self-driving cars, of course, uh, various use applications of our machine learning and artificial intelligence that try to take the various types of data that are collected by sensors and administrative functions of city governments to predict where things are likely to occur, to forecast events, to understand uh, really the, the nature of what's going on within the city, and various technologies for civic engagement, connecting people to one another, providing information. And so the smart city is sort of a, a loose amalgam of all of these technologies. There's not a single sort of, if you have this technology or that technology, you have a smart city, but it's this rough sense of integrating technologies like these into urban life and urban governance specifically. It very much is a function of often city governments wielding this technology, often in collaboration with private companies. And this is not just some sort of pipe dream of a couple technologists. It really is a, a pretty strong consensus vision that's come out over the last five to 10 years around what does the future of city government look like? Uh, everything from the federal government to major companies to governments around the world, uh, chapters of you know, mayor's offices and local governments, and of course major news outlets talking about the smart city as what the future of cities will look like. Uh, almost every city has some form, at least, uh, and I'll, I, I should say that my uh, talk today in the book really focuses in the context of the United States and North America. Uh, don't sort of at this point in time have too much work looking internationally, but I'm happy to talk in Q&A about some of the comparisons and other efforts going on around the world. Uh, but just about every city uh, sort of has some sort of smart city effort, branding themselves in that way. Kansas City calls itself the world's most connected smart city. San Diego calls it, says that it has the world's largest smart city platform. So there's lots of efforts to sort of brand themselves around the smart city uh, bragging about just how smart cities really are in uh, today. So we have these utopian visions of you know, technology coming in to address all of these social problems, but there are a number of questions we need to actually ask of these systems. Uh, first, are the technologies actually capable of doing what, what they promise to do? And if they are capable of doing that, uh, is that even a desirable future? Is the problem that they're trying to solve the right problem? And is the solution that these technologies are providing the right solution? And I want to talk, uh, turn now to why the answer to those questions is no. Why the smart city is really a vision full of false promises and hidden dangers and a particularly dangerous path to us to have as this imaginary of what we're trying to accomplish with the future of cities. So let's talk about what are the limits of technology as a, as a lens through which to approach solving social problems. And a sort of broad motif that I talk about throughout the book is this idea of tech goggles. 
the sort of vision that engineers in particular tend to bring to their work, the, the way that the world looks if you've been trained in you know, computer science and other engineering fields, both how, you, how do you understand problems, how do you understand solutions to those problems. And there are really two broad, uh, what I call myths, of what, you know, sort of how one perceives the world when looking through tech goggles. The first is this view of technology as the driver of social change, that it is technology that shapes the way the world evolves, that society uh, evolves, and that technology is both neutral and objective, that technology not just is the way that the, is the sort of driver of social change, but that the social change it provides is somehow uh, you know, apolitical and socially optimal, that by bringing these tools of optimization to bear on social problems, we can address them in that manner. Uh, the former IBM president has this great description where he says, if the leaders of smarter city systems do share an ideology, it is this. We believe in a smarter way to get things done. So the, the language and ideology here, there's no political ideology. There's just this idea that being smart is a thing that who could argue with that? Why wouldn't you want to be smart? But of course, in doing that, we sort of lose sight of the contested nature of both the problems and the solutions and the sort of inherently contested nature of what a city is and what a city is striving to be. And so these notions of technology as a driver of optimal social change are particularly dangerous. And to see that, I like to turn to this example uh, that is a simulation of what, it, what the city, a cityscape could look like in the future when we have full deployment of autonomous vehicles. And it's a simulation of how you could have these vehicles zooming through city streets. You could have algorithmic systems that connect them all together. You get rid of traffic lights. You eliminate congestion. They, uh, the researchers who put this together like to put this vision side by side with another vision of the status quo where you have a lot of cars waiting for each other and they turn red because everyone's angry and upset. And on first glance, this might look pretty incredible, right? No one really wants to sit in traffic. But on closer inspection, some stuff might jump out at you. There's, uh, it sort of hardly looks like a city at all. There are no people, there are no cyclists, there are no buses, uh, no food trucks, no sort of any of the typical things you might imagine is not just being present in a city, but actually essential to what that city is and what makes that city actually worth living in all of those aspects of the world are not just ignored, they're sort of actively erased in order to create a simplified environment, an abstraction of what the city looks like so that it can be optimized in such a sort of remarkable way. And uh, you know, what's, what's particularly striking about this example is that it actually is supposed to represent a specific intersection in downtown Boston, which looks something like this if you go there. Uh, nothing like that. You spend a couple minutes at that intersection, it's, uh, you'll see tons of cyclists going through every time the lights uh, turn green. There are pedestrians. Uh, it's along one of the major bus lines in the city of Boston and also uh, along some of the major transit stops and transit lines. So suddenly we've turned, we are presented with this vision of you know, what a smart city could look like, this technological solution to our social problem of congestion. But when you actually go and study the context of that problem, you see that there's much more going on. The, the problem is not simply one of congestion, but uh, that what is even the problem here in the first place? There are a great deal of overlapping, intertwined people and needs uh, and social challenges and social opportunities in this space that are sort of erased. And so there's this sort of key function of tech goggles that I think of as distortion, where it takes a complex social reality, such as uh, you know, any street intersection in a busy city, and turns it into one where only the technological, certain technological aspects of that space are, uh, are highlighted. Uh, in this case, you know, what does a city look like through the lens of a computer, where you might have sensors that are able to, you know, and this, is, this I should say is a, is not of that specific location, but is a sort of graphic from a Sidewalk Labs, which is a Google affiliated company that I'll talk about more later. This is like their vision, one vision of sort of the smart city that they're working towards. 
And uh, I often have a slide, especially for more urban planning audiences, so I forgot that today, where I look at, uh, compare this vision of, you know, what does the city look like through a computer to some of the older images from the mid-20th century, sort of like what Le, Le Corbusier's vision of urban planning, this very much this vision of what does a city look like from an airplane and a city that was modeled after that vision. And today we have what does a city look like through the lens of a computer, through the lens of the type of uh, functionality and vision that, an, that, tech, that a computer affords one to look at. So through this process of distortion, we move from uh, understanding the complexity and the politics of life to these sort of abstract technical processes that seem very easy uh, to optimize to provide incredible benefits. But of course, uh, the problem is not necessarily the right problem. And in doing this process of abstraction there and then optimization, there are a great deal of politics embedded in that process. There are winners and losers in terms of what gets deemed essential uh, and needs to be kept within the abstraction and what gets deemed sort of inessential and can be thrown out. And we can see that in the traffic simulation where pedestrians are deemed inessential and in a future with those self-driving cars, uh, it's hard to imagine that city, that city being a place where one could actually have a thriving, uh, a thriving streetscape for pedestrians and cyclists and others. So to come back to sort of the intersection of cities and technology, I'll talk about three specific stories of things that I worked on in the city of Boston and how that embodies particular lessons we need to draw on the role of technology in improving urban welfare. So the first involves uh, open data uh, projects to take the data sets that the city of Boston's been collecting, various, you know, the different agencies that... Uh, that are collecting data, whether that's 311 information or property assessments or anything like that, and bringing that out to the public to say, how can we you know, have this data not just be internal, but open it up to anyone who wants to use it to enhance civic engagement and innovation and things like that. So we spent a lot of time, not just in City Hall, but actually going out to public libraries, going out and talking to people to understand you know, what sorts of issues did they have, what sorts of data did they want to see, sort of specifically what, what data sets did they want and what would they want to do with that data. So we set up booths like this in the different branches of the Boston Public Libraries and we would stop people as they came in and out and ask them those questions about data sets. And what we found was that no one actually really wanted to talk to us. They would sort of politely wave us off or politely just say, I don't know. Uh, but it turned out that it was not that they were friend unfriendly, they weren't you know, uninterested in talking to us, but we weren't asking the right questions. We were asking them about data. When we asked them about their life in the city of Boston, how they liked the schools, what they were concerned about, how their kids liked the parks, all of the types of questions you might ask about someone's life in the city, we had these incredibly rich conversations, long discussions about the past, present, and future of the city of Boston. But it was never really functionally a conversation about data. I mean, we tried to bring it back to data. Uh, as one resident put it, information is fine, but I want a way to influence what's happening. We sort of came to see that the data was not empowering on its own. There was this long tradition around stuff like open data that if you just release the information, it could just immediately solve these problems. But it became clear, and it's almost you know, sort of an obvious insight, but not one that's often brought sort of front and center in smart cities, which is that social problems are rarely technology problems. Uh, the types of issues that people were facing were not necessarily going to be solved by simply having a data set, let alone even providing some analysis based on that data set. And so we really had to move our analysis away from thinking about the data as the mechanism to thinking much more about relationships, much more about what role the data was playing in building community and in uh, empowering different groups to actually advocate for the type of change that they wanted to see in their community. The second story involves an, anal an analysis that I did to try to understand how we could improve the city's investment in sidewalk repairs and sidewalk infrastructure. So we were looking at the data that typically comes, that data that comes in from 311 apps. These are apps where someone can, you know, open up their smartphone, take a picture of a pothole or something like that, notify the city of Boston that there is, you know, an issue on the street. 
And this is the way that the city had been identifying issues and managing its backlog of reports or ma managing its backlog of repairs over the last couple years. And we wanted to look at, does this actually provide us with a good assessment of where we should be going out and doing that work? So we compared uh, on the left, what you see is our own internal assessment that uh, some contractors had done of the sidewalk quality across the city. And on the right, we see where the requests for service uh, are coming in. So in both cases, the red clusters are indicating uh, aggregations of low sidewalks that are deemed to have a low quality or a need of repair. And uh, it's pretty obvious that these are not the same map. And if you're familiar with the city of Boston, what you'll see is that on the left side, there's a great deal, the sort of lower right cluster, you know, it's sort of evenly distributed across the city. Uh, whereas on the right, really all of the uh, sidewalk repair requests are in downtown Boston, the sort of financial district, Back Bay, the sort of wealthy business uh, areas and where the more wealthy residents and whiter residents of the city live. So clearly this data was very misleading. We had this idea that by having everyone submit these requests, we were getting this incredible data set on where we needed to repair sidewalks across the city. What it turned out was we were actually getting data on this much more sort of sociological phenomenon, which was where are there people who have a smartphone who feel that the government will solve their problem, that they have the right to uh, you know, notify the city when they have a problem like this, and that it will be solved. And that's a very different story of where the data, uh, of where sidewalks actually need to be repaired in uh, sort of in reality. So if we're relying on data that's being collected in cities, whether through administrative functions or apps or sensors, we need to understand that often the data that we think, uh, the, the, the insight that we think we're gaining, the data might actually be telling us something very different than what we think it's telling us. And that's an important uh, thing to understand about the limits of this data and the need to bring more than just a sort of narrow technological mindset to understand what other things might be embedded within that data. And finally, I'll talk, uh, there's a project that I worked on with the city's uh, emergency medical services. So this is the group that responds when you call 911 and they send an ambulance uh, or an EMT to, you know, if you have a broken leg, heart attack, whatever it might be. And we started working with them because they were overburdened. There was a big rise. There, you know, the city's population had been rising over the last decade. And the staffing and resources of the department was not keeping up. So there was a huge uh, real uh, limitation in the amount of resources that they had. And they wanted to figure out how they could best use their resources to respond efficiently to the variety of 911 calls that were coming into the city. So when I began working with them, the sort of initial instinct, of course, of a computer scientist coming into this problem would be to say, okay, well, this is just an engineering problem. You have a certain number of calls and we can statistically model those calls. You have a certain number of ambulances and we can just track where they're going to be. And we can create a sort of matching function that can optimize uh, where your ambulances should be stationed at all times and which ambulance you should sh uh, send out at any given time based on our forecasts of what's likely to occur over the next you know, hour or two hours. But it became very clear that that type of solution uh, would not have been a solution at all. When I spent time uh, working with the, the department and actually studying their context, that sort of solution, one, would not have been feasible given their operations, and it wasn't even actually the right problem at all. It turned out that the problem was not just that they were you know, somehow misallocating their resources, but that there was a significant number of calls coming in uh, that were really not about acute medical care, but were about uh, individuals who were suffering from homelessness and drug addiction and mental illness, who, uh, and the EMS department was increasingly the group that was called to deal with those incidents, to deal with uh, you know, someone who might be having a breakdown or might be passed out on the street. But the problem was that these people did not actually require, they didn't need to go to a hospital. What they needed was connection to uh, social services and other forms of welfare. And there was really this huge gap between the services that the city EMS department was providing, which is really an EMT and an ambulance and a trip to a hospital, and the services that were needed. 
it was not a problem of inefficiency. It was a problem of a mismatch between the needs of the public and the resources that were being brought to address those needs. And uh, so what we ended up doing was not simply just you know, developing an algorithmic system to optimize the existing process, but we actually developed a new team uh, within EMS that was specialized in responding to specifically these types of incidents, specially trained in de-escalation for someone in a mental health crisis, and in connecting individuals to the different shelters and other forms of uh, social services that were available across the city of Boston. So, right, there's the sense that actually using technology well relies not just on having what we might think of as really sophisticated technology, but actually uh, pairing the insights from data and algorithms with various forms of non-technological policy uh, innovation, understanding the variety of different ways that we can address these problems. So thinking about these three stories, we can see three really significant pitfalls of the broad move towards smart cities. One is expecting technology to solve all of our problems, treating technology as this neutral, and, uh, this neutral force or a neutral tool for gaining insights, and focusing on technology at the expense of other forms of innovation and change. So there are, and there are two sort of broad additional challenges that smart cities bring that I'll, that I'll talk about now. One are the ways in which uh, the, the deployment of this technology can really fundamentally reshape urban power and politics. Uh, people like to talk about the smart city revolutionizing urban life. And I would say that it will revolutionize urban life, but not in the way that it's often hailed as doing, not by creating these optimal utopian cities, but by really transforming who is actually in control of urban life and who gets to make decisions uh, and who has power and autonomy. All of the technology in smart cities really relies quite centrally on data collection. And so there are massive amounts of surveillance baked into smart cities, both from uh, the government as well as from the private companies that are often the ones behind the sensors that you might see on, uh, on different technologies. Um, and of course, privatization. As more and more technology is integrated into city governments, that technology is almost always uh, adopted or created and managed by a private company. Cities are creating some level of uh, maybe data analysis and they have analytics engineers on their teams, but they're not creating massive deployments of sensor networks. So increasingly technology companies are making a play for city space and city resources through these public-private partnerships. Uh, one of the most significant is in Toronto, where there's a major project where Sidewalk Labs is working to really develop, and they call it develop from the internet up, a city neighborhood in Toronto that's been sort of undeveloped for uh, a couple of decades, I'm not sure how long. And there's a lot of pushback, not just about the idea that they're doing that essentially uh, and Sidewalk Labs is essentially in the Google family. So a Google company coming in and developing this city neighborhood obviously raises huge surveillance and privacy concerns, but also concerns about who actually gets to make a decision about urban life. What happens when a agency, you know, normally you'd have a development board or the city government that's making decisions about zoning and planning and uh, all of that, suddenly you have Google coming in able to make those decisions in a very different way without any sort of enforcement for accountability or transparency. And perhaps in some ways more significantly are the ways in which these visions of technology as solving social problems can obstruct the, more, the types of more systemic reforms that are often needed to address these challenges because technology often can come in as optimizing these systems, but it's really optimizing the status quo. It's optimizing the way that systems already work. And if we're not, and, and actually we can think back to the EMS example, if we had just come in and optimized the resources and the practices that the city was using, uh, we would have really been unable, we would not have solved the problem because that would not have addressed the right problem. We had to actually change the broader model of what was going on and what practices we were actually using. And more importantly, recognizing that a lot of the problem that was leading the city into this space in the first place with the, was the limited resources for EMS, right? The limited uh, sort of the, the legacies and politics of austerity that had meant that 
urban uh, city departments did not have the resources to keep up with demand, and so there's this pressing need to optimize them rather than actually provide them with more resources. Uh, and we saw, for example, with the simulation of self-driving cars, how that can lead to a model of not continuing to move towards dense urban neighborhoods, not focusing on transit and buses and walkability, but emphasizing, well, we don't need to do any of that because self-driving cars are around the corner and they'll be this incredible thing, so all of our congestion worries will go away. And there are actually a number of cities that have developed uh, partnerships with Uber and, uh, and Google and other companies and even started, uh, rather than investing in various forms of transit, just providing subsidies for people to take uh, you know, Uber trips or things like that. But it's a very different model of where does that lead us uh, you know, five, ten years down the road, right? We're not actually addressing the deeper structural urban planning problems that are at the root of these issues of sprawl and greenhouse emissions uh, and a lack of mobility. So, okay, so how can we actually do any of this well? This is all sort of dire and grim. And are there actually things we can take away from all of this for how do we integrate technology into city governments, into urban life, uh, to address social problems. So the frame that I bring out in the book is what I call it smart enough cities. This idea uh, of removing the notion of smart cities, which is very much, as I said, focused on technology, really positioning technology as, as the key thing, right? The way you get smarter is by having more technology. So by inserting this uh, notion of smart enough cities, the goal that I have is not to throw away technology, not to say that all of this is terrible, and certainly not to say that the answer is to be smart or to be dumb, but to say that we need to really think about our technology from a much more uh, pragmatist approach, right, of what are we actually trying to solve? The technology is not an end in itself. The technology is a means towards achieving a variety of social ends and is really only as valuable as to the extent that it's able to actually help us do that. So, so what, are, what are some principles that we can uh, have to actually embody that? It sort of maybe sounds obvious, but how do we actually you know, get to that point where we can approach these problems in that manner? The first is, and in many ways the most important to me, is to approach this as addressing complex problems rather than trying to solve artificially simple ones. City life and urban processes are incredibly complex, and to optimize systems in the way that we often want to with technology to solve them often requires creating artificial simplifications of those problems, right? We take a complex city street and we turn it into uh, a space where all that there is are cars, and then we can solve that problem. But these problems are never ones to be solved. I like to use the language of addressing, because I think once you start talking about solutions, uh, to complex problems, you end up simplifying the problem because a, a solution to the real problem is impossible. So in one city that has approached this in a very different way is Columbus, Ohio, which in 2015 or, or 2016 won a $40 million grant from the Department of Transportation to sort of create like a new uh, smart transportation system. But rather than just focusing on you know, ending traffic with automated vehicles, they really focused on the connection between er, uh, social mobility and uh, sort of physical transportation mobility and understanding the ways in which these problems are intertwined. They actually went out, went to different neighborhoods, particularly low-income neighborhoods where there are particularly acute public health challenges, and tried to understand the variety of barriers to accessing mobility, accessing doctor's appointments and job interviews and all of that. And it was not simply you know, just a, a, an issue of congestion, but an issue of a lack of resources for childcare, a lack of information about you know, what types of uh, transit and transportation were actually available, uh, issues where certain types of transportation providers like Uber typically require a credit card, and if you're unbanked, you are not actually able typically to get access to those. And so they, uh, as they described uh, after the fact, they said, we really needed to look at it from a more holistic viewpoint. As geeky technology people, we wouldn't have thought about these things had we not considered the whole picture. So they were able to come up with a broad array of solutions from you know, improving access to internet, improving the accessibility of uh, buses and 
and the accessibility of different payment options and providing, making accessible even uh, paying for rides through uh, Medicare and Medicaid often for people who are going to doctor's appointments, things like that. So really addressing the, the particular intricacies of why these issues of mobility were such a problem and focusing on the real problems facing real people rather than trying to you know, create these optimal solutions that sound really great on a press release. Uh, second is implementing technology to address social needs and advance policy. This sounds really so obvious to seem really trivial, but is actually really the place where a lot of smart city projects go wrong, where the allure of technology uh, prompt cities to adopt the types of goals that align with technology because the technologies seem really incredible. Cities start thinking in terms of efficiency and optimization, uh, which is what these technologies provide and what the technology vendors are selling them, when those values may not actually be the things that they were striving for in the first place and uh, certainly don't apply in all aspects of urban life. In many cases, inefficiency uh, is quite valuable. Uh, so uh, maybe I'll skip, skip this and sort of to move on, but we can talk about some of the civic engagement efforts underway if people are, are interested in the ways in which, uh, in civic engagement in particular, understanding uh, the value of inefficiency is incredibly important, right? Civic engagement, conversation, is not meant to be a streamlined process, but meant to be one of uh, coming to terms with other people's perspectives and, and all of that. So places in city government and urban life where inefficiency is actually incredibly valuable and carving out space for that as a valued thing, not as something to be erased, but something to be cherished. Uh, number three, and sort of along those lines, is prioritizing innovative policy and program reforms above innovative technology. Again, thinking about the ways that a policy change is really the driver of any type of urban progress. It's not the technology on its own, but the technology perhaps in conjunction with other, other aspects. So one of the, the major places uh, of smart city development is around policing, and there's lots of efforts to create algorithms known as predictive policing to try to forecast where crime is going to occur and uh, you know, optimize where to send police to address those crimes. And often in this way of responding to concerns about police discrimination, racial profiling, all of that. But of course, that type of system is not really addressing the underlying problem. It's simply addressing perhaps to some extent where police are going on a day-to-day -day basis. But other cities are taking a very different approach. So in Johnson County, Kansas, for instance, rather than thinking about it as how do we just optimize our existing policing system. They've spent actually the last 20 years really thinking about how do we change our policing uh, strategy or really our public safety and, and social welfare strategy, understanding that the, the, the solution here is not simply to take someone who's in some form of distress and lock them up in jail, but to actually provide them with different types of services that might prevent them from coming into contact with police in the first place. In, uh, in many cities, especially local jails, often it are sort of a ton of people end up there because of unaddressed mental health and drug addiction crises, and the police become the response to those problems. But in places like Johnson County, Kansas, they've really reshaped responding to those incidents with uh, you know, de escalation, people who are trained in de escalation and bringing them to social services. And then ultimately, bringing together machine learning systems to really improve the functionality of that rather than simply waiting for uh, a call to come in for someone who is maybe in crisis and have to be dealt with in some form, actually I'm trying to understand who, how do we predict who's likely to end up uh, absent the, any sort of intervention, who is likely to end up in jail for this type of mental health crisis or something like that. How can we proactively provide them with services, get them on a better track, and prevent this from ever happening? And by pairing both the policy change with the algorithm, uh, they've been able to really boost their ability to do this and their ability to uh, address these problems before they even arise. And this is a project that's been ongoing for several years, and they're still working to implement this type of system. But uh, on one test, they found that over 50% of the people that they identified 
uh, as likely to end up in jail would have, did in fact end up in jail. And had they prevented all of those bookings, they could have prevented uh, 180 uh, bookings into jail and over 18 years of total jail time. So the gains here are pretty significant. And in particular, the gains not just of a policy change, but of a long-term planning vision, right? This is something that they had been working on for about 20 years in various ways. So it's not just sort of, you know, the way we talk about smart cities is often the technology come in, you'll snap your fingers, the problem is solved. It's much more that these problems take incredible amounts of time to get the right policies, to build coalitions, all of that. So another aspect is ensuring that technology's design and implementation promote democratic values. I described a little bit earlier how the way in which we conceive of these problems, the way that we conceive of these solutions, and think of what we're actually trying to solve and what needs to be kept in any sort of abstraction of urban life is really a, a source of incredible power to be able to say that these are the values that our systems are going to embody and these are the values that they're not going to embody. And of course, the, one of the really significant ones here is around privacy and all of the issues of uh, surveillance. I often show a map of New York City where many of you, I'm sure, have all seen the Link NYC kiosks that are out and about around the city. And those are uh, also owned and operated essentially by Sidewalk Labs, uh, the Google company I described earlier. And the way that that system operates is that the city does not pay for it. The city has uh, created a partnership with Sidewalk Labs. Sidewalk Labs provides public internet to anyone in exchange for the ability to collect data and sell ads to people based on that data. So what is, in theory, this great public service of free Wi-Fi, something that is quite important, is then sort of offered in exchange for, uh, for the imposition of surveillance, the imposition of data collection. And this is something that really was never put up for any sort of public discussion. Uh, another sort of very topical local thing is around algorithms. Many of you will likely maybe have heard of the uh, New York City Algorithmic Decision-Making Task Force. Uh, and so that was an effort to do, to turn the way, so New York City has a lot of different algorithmic systems from policing to schools uh, to the fire department that manage various systems. And again, the question of who gets to develop these things, does the public have any insight? Does the public get to audit these systems? In what ways uh, are these systems prioritizing certain groups or benefiting or harming different groups? And how do we make sure that the public actually has insight and power over that? Uh, so that was a process of about a year, uh, a little bit sort of uh, dysfunctional and disappointing for those who are involved. Uh, but that sort of wrapped up over the last couple of months. And there's a lot of ongoing debates around, especially in New York City Council, around how do we define the scope of what is an algorithmic system that needs to be uh, regulated? And how do we do that? What sorts of city mechanisms uh, what sorts of people need to be responsible for that. There's an, uh, an open call for, a, I think, chief algorithms officer in New York City. So this is a very sort of hot topic right now here in the city and something that there's a lot of opportunity to get involved in uh, locally. Um, and then sort of finally is a piece on sort of thinking about it actually operationally. What does it mean within city government to use data and technology effectively? The visions for smart cities, as I described, are sort of this uh, you know, you'll magic drop of a hat. You'll have the technology. Your problems will be solved. But typically, it's, it's not about having the best technology and really using this well as about implementation and uh, integration of technology and policy and people. Uh, there's a fun story uh, in, from Boston when they were had lots of, you know, in Boston, the city leadership would have lots of conversations with vendors. And at one point, a major tech company came in, you know, giant Fortune 500 company comes in and gives them a great pitch. And when the city leadership asks, you know, okay, so we see all this technology, what's it actually going to be used for? Uh, the salesperson just says, that's the exciting part. We give you the platform and the data, and you get to figure out all the ways you can get value from it. Not exactly a great pitch for a system that would have costed millions of dollars up front uh, without any clear process of how to use it with complete sort of lack of attention paid to those aspects. So 
to sort of close out another local story, actually, I'll talk about sort of why you need to have attention to integrating all of this together uh, based on something that happened in New York City in 2015. There was a massive outbreak of Legionnaire's disease in around August of 2015, uh, which is essentially like an acute form of pneumonia, so you don't want to get it. And it was incubating in the cooling towers on top of large apartment buildings and places like that that sort of manage the air conditioning systems. And so this happened. There are a couple people I think had already uh, died from it. And there, the city, the public health department really had to figure out how do we stop this from spreading? How do we make sure that this doesn't become a really big issue? And the starting point, because, uh, because it was incubating in those cooling towers, the city had to actually go out and inspect and clean every cooling tower across the city to make sure that they were had it under control. The problem was they didn't actually know the location and owner and identity of every cooling tower across the city. That was not something they had ever collected. They had various types of data about apartment buildings and owners split across a number of different departments, and they could sort of infer which ones might have cooling towers but not others. Uh, so there was, first of all, this incredible challenge of actually bringing together data sets that had never been brought together before, right? Information from the Department of Buildings, the Department of Finance. Typically, you know, they have their data. No one really thinks about it outside of the department. So it was incredibly onerous to actually bring it all together. Uh, but ultimately, they, they managed to some extent. They were able to build some machine learning algorithms based on that. Uh, helping to direct the various city agencies to do the inspections and the cleaning uh, and stop the, stop the crisis before it got out of hand. But what became clear from this process was that there was a huge uh, limitation in the city's ability to actually take advantage of the various resources that it had. They didn't know what data they had. They didn't know people in one department wouldn't know what information the other departments had often didn't know how to use it, all of these issues. Uh, and so they developed, I guess, sort of two different frameworks for dealing with that. One is uh, what, I just, what they describe as data drills, which you can think of as, you know, so a normal fire drill, you would pretend what happens in a fire. They would have data drills where they would pretend what happens in a crisis and have 24 hours where they would get the heads of a bunch of different departments to actually come in and say, okay, there's a blackout in Brooklyn. We need to bring together all of our data that we have to you know, understand where we need to send help and who's going to be most vulnerable based on the information they have. So really practicing uh, how to work with different types of data that, that's spread across different agencies, uh, building systems to actually create some of that infrastructural backbone so that uh, you know, information about the different buildings and parcels across the city could actually be integrated across different agencies in a, in a sustainable way. Uh, and ultimately, they sort of have this framework of you know, data management leading to data support, leading to the analytics. And everyone wants to talk just about the sort of top part of this, the analytics, but it's really the management and support that makes all of that possible. So, uh, yeah, so hopefully I've uh, sort of convinced you of the many dangers of smart cities, the value of shifting to uh, an approach of smart enough cities, really emphasizing the need to integrate technology into holistic visions of democratic and egalitarian urban futures. Thank you. I'm happy to take questions, comments, any, any thoughts. I'll also note that the book is uh, also available open access online. So if you don't want to actually buy it, you can just read it all online for free uh, and access it that way. So yeah. Any questions? Yeah. Um, I really appreciated the talk. I had a question about um, like you had to find approaches and then you had to tech all the way to the start. Yeah. And I'm thinking about um, what are your thoughts on times when taking off the tech goggles itself a task. For example, the discussion around uh, facial recognition ban in California was very recent. That seems to me like specifically taking off the tech goggles, not replacing it with a different solution necessarily. Mm -hmm. I thought, I'm curious to have any thoughts on approaches that aren't just like here are better solutions, but also specifically have to be anti tech, not better tech. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, so, so the, uh, uh, 
um, the, the subtitle I almost went with was taking off our tech goggles to, so I mean, and, and I would say that the, yeah, the sort of five sort of design principles I describe are, are less about, you know, better tech and are all specifically about how do we approach these problems without tech goggles, right? What does it look like to not to take them off, to not have that approach and to not think of that that we need to have better tech, but how do we actually move the conversation away from the sort of lens of technology where we're you know, able to debate, okay, well, this technology is imperfect, but then how do we just create a better version of that technology to a conversation of, it's not clear the technology, let's, let's go back to square one and say, what is the problem that we're trying to even solve? What are the ways of solving that problem? And then, you know, maybe technology has some role there, but really expanding the frame of analysis, which is exactly that point about about taking them off, so, yeah. Yes? So, um, when you, in your third proposition of smart enough technology, there seems to be an underlying assumption or there is a threshold, right? The, 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 the city has to have certain kind of resources, certain kind of capacity, to actually mm -hmm. do mm -hmm. And so in your case studies, um, in some of these uh, far away places, whether using technology actually is worth it. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, you, you say we're not ditching, right? so I'm just curious um, in the cost benefit way. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there are absolutely significant differences in the resources that, you know, a small city has versus a place like New York City. Uh, but I think in many ways, you know, the point, one of the main points that I, I try to show is that it's actually not about having the sort of fanciest, most sophisticated technological sort of rollouts. And often it's relatively simple things like just pulling your data together and having some, you know, data scientists build a system on top of that, uh, that is actually often most effective. Um, and so I find that, I mean, so, you know, looking at the example, for example, of like Johnson County, Kansas, that's not a massive city with huge amounts of resources or Columbus, Ohio. I mean, that's a pretty big city, but not, uh, you know, the system is really, the, the approach is really less about, you know, it's exactly saying we don't need to have Link NYC. We don't need to have the massive infrastructure investments in many cases that, are millions and millions of dollars, those are often sort of a red herring and a wrong approach. And it's uh, sometimes the smaller things that are more effective and sort of building practices from the ground up in cities. Uh, there are definitely challenges that, you know, the smaller cities face just in terms of getting resources and uh, actually having even one or two people who can focus on that work. Um, but, you know, I think that the, the goal at least is for the idea of smart enough cities to be sort of flexible enough to, think about less, it's, it's less about, you know, it's moving away from that idea of having the most technology to thinking about what type of technology is actually useful and actually sort of tailored to our particular needs. Uh, yeah. I was wondering, given that, if you have actually conceptualized what, what does enough means and who gets to define what enough mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's it's huge, and I wouldn't. Uh, you know, I think locally, really. I mean, to me, the, the entire question is right. Who gets to decide? And the you know, I see it less as about you know, I sort of have the the media, maybe like mezzanine level principles for how to approach these things, but certainly. I wouldn't want to come in and say, you know, this is the type of technological system or pairing that is always good because it has to be very contextualized, I think. Uh, and I am particularly really focused in a lot of my work on uh, making sure that more and more people are able to have those be part of those conversations. So a lot of the efforts that really have even come about and really gained momentum in the last couple of years since I wrote the book and it's come out have been, uh, you know, stuff like this, the New York City Council effort on algorithms, various surveillance oversight ordinances, uh, facial recognition bans, all efforts that are actually bringing more people in, uh, providing more transparency about these systems and allowing more of the public to have a voice and saying, you know what, that's, we don't want facial recognition to be used by the police. There is just, uh, 
And I think maybe last month there was a hearing for something called the, the Post Act in New York, uh, where a bunch of advocates came and talked about why we needed more information about various uh, algorithms and technologies being used by the police department. So to me, the, the question of who gets to decide is, is so central. And I'm more interested in sort of creating the mechanisms for more and more people to be part of that conversation than uh, sort of specifying exactly where the threshold might be of you know, enough versus not enough or something like that. Um, yeah. Um, first of all, thank you so much for the talk. Um, I found it really fascinating, especially the point about emphasizing on the support of management for technology and also how it could stand in the way of a structural reform that we, is actually needed. But um, I also want to talk about how, you know, um, there's like actually the emerging trend of like community technology within the field of smart cities where um, the technologies, instead of the cheeky technologies, they actually work with the social anchors, like the, the existing social infrastructure, like the nonprofit, the mm -hmm. churches, and libraries, like who has been working inside the neighborhood for like decades that understand the social and structural divide. Um, I guess the question is, like, uh, especially from your case studies that you mentioned, like Ohio and Kansas, you seem to be advocating for building kind of like a new layer of social infrastructure saying, um, saying for example, like, um, almost like from, like a, so, so I guess like the question is like, do, are you suggesting to say, creating new um, services, new support and management to specifically work with technology, or what do you think of like, the current approach of just like working with the existing social, um, Organizations in that way, you know, they wouldn't be like standing in the way of the structural reform. Instead, they actually work with the community organizations. Um, although the cavity might be like those social organizations, they might not be tech savvy and they might not really have the ba the background enough for that. Like, I guess, what's your mm -hmm. uh, what's your stand on that? Yeah, yeah, that's that's a super important topic, and I very much view it as the existing organizations both within cities, within the community, community groups. I mean, that's really the place to start uh, very much in opposition to the way that it's often, you know, the private companies, Google, Cisco, et cetera, that are coming in and sort of uh, parachuting in with these various technologies. So then the question becomes, you know, how do we shift to that model? How do we actually enable technology to be, to the extent it should be sort of integrated into those into those institutions. Uh, one model that I think has been pretty successful is when city governments actually bring in data science teams internally. Uh, that's sort of the group, the type of group that I was in in the city of Boston, where we had a team of uh, data scientists and others who were working sort of, but working in a city department, but then spread across the city agencies in terms of what types of projects we worked on. So I described, you know, working with EMS, working with public works, the fire department, all of that. And really to this point of integration, the point is to have the technological expertise and knowledge and capacity uh, on the inside of these organizations rather than on the outside, either as a completely independent layer or completely residing with the, with the companies that are coming in. Uh, and I think there's been a real shift over the last, you know, maybe five to ten years where, you know, in 2012, uh, uh, you know, big company would come in, they would pitch something to a city, and no one in the city really knew enough about technology to actually ask the right questions, to actually sort of like call them out on false or misleading claims, things like that, uh, or even to know what they wanted. And now, over the last couple of years, it's completely reversed where companies are coming in with you know, sort of these not that impressive solutions or approaches. And now there are enough uh, experience with technology and enough people who have, who actually are trained specifically in building technology to know, you know, this isn't actually an effective system. Your claims about the performance actually don't hold up. Um, and that's very much on the internal side. You know, obviously a lot of this and a lot of the, I think the most exciting work is happening outside of city governments. Um, you know, groups like the ACLU have been super important, uh, and other groups like that, really bringing in more and more technologists. And I, uh, in Massachusetts, I, when I was there, worked a lot with the Mass ACLU, and they do great work uh, pushing, you know, bringing different community organizations who care about 
racial justice, about policing reform to the table to push for legislative change, push for uh, democratic controls on this type of technology. Um, so, you know, those sorts of efforts are really key. And, you know, the challenge then is uh, continuing to just bring more uh, technological, really just fluency into community groups and places like that, less because they necessarily, like, need to have more technology, but because if nothing else, they need to understand the ways in which technology is intersecting with them, uh, right? So whether, you know, if you're, I mean, so even just to give one example, uh, over the last year, there was a major effort uh, in response to, there was an apartment building where the, the landlord wanted to put facial recognition systems in the building. Uh, this is like the Atlantic Towers, if you want to look up uh, more about it. But the residents, uh, you know, wouldn't, uh, you know, push back on this. They worked with uh, my group at NYU, AI Now, and some others, and was able to, you know, push against both this system and actually now lead to various types of legislation saying that facial recognition cannot be used in public housing, things like that. So again, this is an issue, you know, if you're, if you care about housing justice and then you might not think you need to care about technology, but the technology is starting to come to you. If you care about policing and racial justice and economic justice and any of these issues, uh, the technology is certainly coming to you. So in some ways, uh, it's sort of shifted to being an offensive, quote unquote, where it's you need to be building the technology, although there's value in that, to at least being able to understand the technology to push back on the ways in which technology is imposing on you. Yeah. This might be more like a data technology, like epistemology question. I'm down. But, cool. um, Maybe. But, <laughs> but you, you kind of started <clears> off <throat> your talk at the beginning and like kind of the data bias, kind of misrepresentation, mm -hmm. algorithmic bias of, of, of data and technology. And I wonder, you know, and like kind of how that kind of inherent like the inherent issues with data and technology can lead to kind of certain un unwelcome outcomes, and thus the reason kind of why you need to work with kind of you know government and cops, etc. Um, but I wonder if you know I can challenge that notion a bit and ask like, what if we you know were in a scenario where we had like all the data, you know, mm -hmm. like you know, Constantine Quantipasses, like quantified human self, or I forget what the mm -hmm. it's called, where you have a sensor on kind of everything, on buildings, on people, on you know streets, etc. Mm -hmm. So what if you were able to kind of just like collect all the data, right? Um, wouldn't that kind of lead to more accurate, less biased kind of algorithms, etc.? Mm -hmm. Great question. <laughs> okay, so I'll leave aside any of the like privacy yeah, yeah, surveillance yeah. aspects yeah. of that. Let's just think about from yeah. So. There, yeah, I mean, so the main way I would talk about, think about that is that there's an, there's an assumption often when we talk about the limits and failures and harms of technology that the issue is a technical problem, right? That the issue is, oh, we just don't have enough data, the data is actually biased. If only we had more representative data and more of that representative data, we could solve these problems. But the problem is that the so much of the game, so to speak, is in actually understanding what the problem is in the first place, being able to have these broader discussions. Uh, and so in many cases, it's, you know, so in my area of thinking about criminal justice reform and algorithms, and there's lots of conversations about why these algorithms are biased, for example. But the real problem is not that the algorithm is biased. The real problem is that the algorithm is actually not an effective tool for achieving the types of criminal justice reform that are advocated for, or that it's even supposed to be creating. Uh, similarly, you know, facial recognition, the problem is not that the underlying data sets are biased and so that it's less accurate for one group than another. The problem is that it's creating this massive surveillance network and the more accurate it is, the more legitimate it becomes as a tool to deploy uh, you know, across our public spaces. So a lot of my actually more recent work is diving into exactly these questions of why do we have to move, uh, you know, I sort of 
talk about it in terms of epistemic reform, right? Move from not just thinking about reforming the technology, but re reforming the lens with which we're approaching the role of technology in creating social change uh, and moving from a model where we see everything as sort of tweaks within the, within the bounds of what it means to do engineering to actually uh, opening up to other modes of analysis and understanding that the best possible engineering in the world is not going to solve these problems because it's not the right approach. And yeah, I actually particularly like the model of imagining, okay, I, we can critique the technical aspects of this system, but let's imagine that the system is perfect and let's talk about why it's still bad. Uh, and that being, I think, a really important sort of mode of analysis because if we just talk about the technical issues, we invite the like, well, here's a slightly better technical solution. And what we need is to change the, the approach to even understanding what the problem is in the first place. So. Other questions? There, yeah. Um, just a quick question. Um, you talked a lot about democratic values and uh, about how you also have to involve the community mm -hmm. to avoid the pitfalls of like tech goggles and everything. Um, could you maybe go through like an example or two of what like good community involvement looks like, or like some cases you've come across? Because I think with the New York City Task Force report, one criticism was that community voices mm -hmm. didn't, weren't sufficiently heard. I think the Toronto example, community voices were kind of co-opted by like city and yeah. sidewalk labs yeah. interests. So what would like a good model of community involvement in those projects? Yeah, like? yeah. I mean, those are those are great examples of what it doesn't look like, or really what a superficial version of it looks like. Uh, I think it's very easy to do to do it in a way that sounds like you're being inclusive and having these conversations, but you're not actually. Um, you know, I, I think it's really hard. There's not like a great singular model of what it looks like. And I would say there's sort of, there's two different ways of thinking about it, probably more than two, but one would be, right, the model of sort of proactive civic engagement, things like that. The other is more of a um, thinking about it in terms of like, I don't know, like a legalistic model where it's like, okay, something like the, the city council legislations in a variety of cities that say, you know, before you want to use the surveillance technology, you have to have a, you have to have a report, you have to have a city council hearing, you need city council approval. Uh, that is one sort of mechanism with teeth for bringing more people into the conversation. Um, and I think that's an incredibly powerful one as we've seen sort of, uh, and many of you probably have know this much more deeply than I do around histories of urban planning and urban civic engagement, which just sort of bringing people into the table is not always enough uh, and often can be sort of, you know, a veil for in explicitly ignoring that type of input. Um, but I do think one story I actually skipped over was in Chicago. Uh, they were developing a set of sensors known as the array of things, uh, sort of a sensor network to collect a bunch of data and you know, raises all the alarm bells about data collection and surveillance. Um, but they actually did a pretty, I would say really, probably the most robust job I've seen of any city to have conversations about privacy and what people wanted these city, what these technologies to look like, actually re releasing draft versions of policy proposals and privacy policies and actually allowing the public to comment on those, uh, adjusting their processes based on that, uh, holding sort of educational info sessions to teach people about this technology. Um, so, but you know, a couple aspects that are worth noting there. One, and a really important thing is, right, the structure of this system. So that system was not owned by a company. It was actually through academic institutes. It was funded by the National Science Foundation. So, you know, lacking the profit motive to collect a lot of data, it's much easier to be you know, uh, sort of magnanimous in having these conversations and taking care of that input because uh, there were research, there was a research agenda involved, but not sort of the fundamental bottom line and from a profit perspective that, you know, makes one uh, far less interested in hearing about ways to collect less data. Um, and, you know, another aspect being that that was not necessarily a set of civic engagement around you know, at the first part of the process saying, you know, to what extent do we want this technology at all? How do we want, you know, if we were to have a bunch of scientists and engineers and millions of dollars in funding to do something, what would we want to do? Uh, you know, there's still a limit of how much they're brought into sort of the, 
the broader conception of the project. Um, but I think that that one, and that's I read about that in the book, uh, is is a good example of sort of like towards the best case example of doing something like that. But again, it relies very much on the good faith actors uh, and the lack of, you know, sort of the institutional structure of what's involved there. And I think there's a lot of need for things that are also more sort of with teeth and enforcement to actually say you need to have these people at the table. You need to have these conversations before uh, actually embarking on this sort of technological uh, usage. Yeah. Uh, one thing that I wonder to hear your thoughts on in general, one of the things about um, that I see as particularly problematic of the way that tech law has been conceived is the idea that all of this is convenient. Like what you were mentioning. Is what? Yeah, it's convenient. Yeah. Like what you were mentioning is sort of, I think of it almost like the Edward and Rose moment where a tech company is kind of sitting and say, we have this amazing thing, you figure out what to do with it. Um, so, but on the other hand, technology in many forms, different forms of data analysis, has been in decline in cities since the advent of statistics. Um, so I wonder how you think about um, those kinds of historical precedents in mm -hmm. making an argument for um, what tech should look like. Yeah. Yeah, I think there, there are actually a couple of different sort of histories that I draw out in the book that I think are really instructive. Uh, one, I sort of briefly alluded to sort of the histories of, you know, high modern urban planning, Le Corbusier and those, um, and how we've long had this vision of cities of, you know, we can create optimal cities based on the technology of today, whether, you know, 100 years ago, that technology may have been very different than what it is today. Then you had last century, the idea of, you know, cars come in and we have this whole pitch around the motor age and structurally very similar, right? That we have uh, companies with a huge desire to sell and create this vision, to really create a market, a huge market for themselves uh, so that everyone would buy cars and they would create these incredible utopian visions of, you know, the futuristic cities looking forward to the 60s or 70s or 80s without traffic and you'd have these beautiful freeways and cars going through and there's like great videos online of that. Um, so di totally different technology, but very much the same story. Uh, and I think that those are really powerful. And so, like, we, this is not the first time we've thought that there's a utopian future made possible by technology. Uh, and all of those have gone, turned out pretty badly. And we're like acting in this, you know, case of cars, we're like really actively trying to undo all of those mistakes. Uh, so let's re like try to see those parallels and think about how we can avoid in, you know, uh, 2120 being like, wow, we really messed up with all of those smart cities and let's try to deconstruct all of those now um, if we even make it that far. But, <laughs> you know, I think that those are really, they're definitely there uh, and they're quite powerful. I don't always know how convincing they are, uh, different mode of, organ of argumentation for different people, but I find them compelling. Yeah. Yeah. Um, maybe, uh, I guess, can you talk a little bit about the um, Emotional or institutional reasons. Like, for example, um, I imagine that a group of people agreeing with everything you say could still be driven by technology because there's a lot of incentives. There are very clear metrics. Mm -hmm. like, mm -hmm. data as to whether or not it's you know, I'm sure that we have in contact with a very high degree. You know? So, there, I'm sure, I imagine there are a lot of institutional and personal reasons why, even if everyone and it really agrees with, with what you say. There are a lot of compelling reasons to like, what if we just have one contact with it? Mm -hmm. you know, and do you have any thoughts on that? And also, is it the role of those five different strategies we're talking about to adapt to the language of metrics for action, you know, like specific results, or to kind of change results altogether? In short, like someone agreeing with everything you said, and the reason there are still reasons why you're feeling very mm -hmm. about that this isn't about performance, this is about yeah. Yeah. So I'll, I'll quickly answer that. I know it's 2.30, so I'll give a quick answer and we can talk more after. I think I struggle with that all the time where I sort of increasingly hear city officials talk in the language that embodies things that I talk about, but then in practice, they don't really do anything that different. Uh, there's definitely political incentives. I think one reason to go sort of more towards a public audience engagement, sort of a, a book like this, is to try to shift some of the dynamics where for a city government, it's not 
no longer the incentive where you can like do this technology, whether or not it works, you're gonna get some great press and all of that. Uh, that even now there is much more of a model where like the press will be like, well, wait, there are privacy concerns, but wait, look at this other city. And there's enough fluency now to know and distrust in big tech companies uh, so that some of those incentives are shifting. Um, and then, you know, I think to some extent, I try to make things legible within the language that sort of city operate managers are often working in. But, you know, a lot of this ultimately is actually about breaking out of that mold and realizing the limitations of like a really narrow performance management type framework in city government. Um, and that's a large task that goes beyond just smart cities. But I think that that sort of mode of thinking is absolutely sort of at play here, especially in as a barrier from a mode of thinking that sounds good to actually doing something different about it. And a lot of what I do is try to think about how to bridge that divide. So thanks. All right, that's 2.30. I'll let you all go. <laughs> Thank you.